Good afternoon, class. This is Professor Mike. This is Healthcare Management 4323. We are looking at Chapter 2 in the textbook for delivering healthcare in America. And in Chapter 2, we're going to be talking about the beliefs, values, and health, what that means. And so, as a reminder, this is supplementary. This is not a substitute for your reading, but this is a way to help facilitate um, your learning and understanding. So feel free to use as you like. And so let's start with the learning objectives for chapter two. And so in this chapter, we'll be talking a lot about the concepts of health and disease. We'll be talking about risk factors and the role of health promotion and disease prevention, moving from a mindset of illness to a mindset of wellness. And so we'll talk about what these disease prevention requisites look like under the Affordable Care Act, also known as ACA. We'll be talking about public health and its expanding role in health protection in the United States and globally as well. And lastly, lastly, we'll be talking about the determinants of health and measures related to health as well. We'll also be talking about the American cultural values and their implications on the healthcare delivery system. We'll be talking about the concepts of justice and equity in healthcare. According to various theories, we'll be talking about the integration of the individual, but also how that integrates with population health. And so let's get started. Looking at the introduction to this chapter, <clears throat> there's a 10 year Healthy People's Initiative that definitely deserves uh, some reading in the textbook. This talks about the influence of various anthrocultural factors. There'll be discussion on the evolution of healthcare services and a discussion on the equity and the distribution of healthcare services. And so what is the significance for managers, policymakers, and potentially you in your future career of these elements? Right. Well, it's going to be the health of a population that determines healthcare utilization. For example, more than half of the United States is considered obese or overweight. This is definitely having an impact on the design, implementation, and cost of healthcare plans in the United States. As a result, this impacts the design of ways that we educate the public in order to provide preventative and therapeutic initiatives to combat said disease. This also creates opportunities to evaluate the effectiveness of different healthcare organizations, or as you will hear, hear referred to as ACOs, which will result in the measure of health status and healthcare utilization. And so let's talk about the basic concepts of health. What is health? Well, health is defined as a medical model, right, that looks at the absence of illness or disease. Sociologists have a different definition. They define health as a state of optimal capacity. Lots of room for interpretation there. There's also a biopsychosocial model, and then there's a more holistic view, and all these have their merits. So what is quality of life? Quality of life is a word you'll be hearing a lot in this industry. Quality of life can be defined as the overall satisfaction both during and following the healthcare delivery and the encounter with that system. This is actually a metric by which many people are paid for the perception of quality of life on behalf of the patient. Quality of life is an indicator of how satisfied that person is with their healthcare experience and the overall satisfaction with life and self perceptions of their health, also not during the service, but after the intervention as well. Now we'll be talking about risk factors and disease. I think it's really important that you take a look in your textbook of the epidemiology triangle, but know that um, risk factors, right? This, these increase the likelihood of developing a particular disease or condition. And so risk factors are always taken into consideration, whether you're a, a healthcare provider or administrator into how the delivery of the healthcare initiative will be done. We also look at behavioral risk factors as well. There's some good data in the textbook on the percentage of the US population with behavioral risks. And then continuing this conversation of risk factors, 
it's important to understand the difference between acute, subacute, and chronic conditions. This determines one, how healthcare providers administer treatment, and two, how healthcare organizations uh, manage them and ensure and pay for them as well. Now, chronic conditions in the United States are on a steep rise, and so why? Well, one, there's new diagnostic diagnostic there's new diagnostic methods and so we're getting better and better at identifying um, chronic conditions at the same time there's evolving medical procedures and um, constantly evolving pharmaceuticals and so there's more opportunities to treat these chronic conditions while in the past they may have been left untreated secondly there's increasing screening and diagnosis we're working at getting better in the healthcare system, like I mentioned earlier, at being preventative as opposed to reactive and focusing on wellness as opposed to illness. And so that results in higher screening and diagnosis. And lastly, lifestyle choices. It doesn't take long for us to walk around outside and look around and see that lifestyle choices of Americans today are definitely impacting the healthcare system. And so then what are the three principles of a health promotion and disease prevention program, right? Health promotion and disease prevention programs. Think of, you might have encountered some of these when you were in elementary school or middle school. These are designed to have a long-term positive impact on affecting the health of a particular nation or area. So think about non-smoking initiatives and things of that nature. So the three principles are one, first looking at the health risk, right? What is the health risk of the population? Two, what are the possible interventions available for counteracting those key risk factors? And three, can you provide adequate public health and social services in order to do so? And so what does disease prevention look like under the Affordable Care Act, also known at the AC, as the ACA? And you'll need to take a look at this but there's several uh, acronyms that will be important to remember. One is the Prevention and Public Health Fund that formed as a result, also known as a PPHF. And of course, we have the CDC. This is the Center for Disease Control. They've established a National Diabetes Prevention Program, also known as the NDPP. Diabetes or pre-diabetes is a major contributing factor to the increasing and rising healthcare costs of the United States as if an individual becomes pre-diabetic or diabetic, then everything else can fall afterwards like a domino effect, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, those types of things. And so diabetes prevention is a big initiative. And so this results in funding in order to establish, right, to create, but also to evaluate uh, wellness programs to minimize these um, unhealthy occurrences in the United States. So moving on. What is public health? Well, public health deals with um, and promotes optimal health for society as a whole. Right? This can be not just individual health protection, but also environmental health as well. And this can also include, as many of you probably know better than you want to, health, protect, health protection during global pandemics. Right? How to protect various populations from a variety of of old and new threats, but doing so through global cooperation, which understandably there's probably some opportunities for us to improve in that. And so what does health protection and preparedness look like in the United States, right? There are several things that are focused on in order to deal with threats. These require very large scale preparations. One, it's making sure you provide the tools and training for workers and medical care. Two, having an understanding of what your public health uh, goal or objectives are. Two, how we provide and execute emergency care. And uh, lastly, how will this uh, integrate and coordinate with civil defense agencies at both the federal, state, and local levels. And so looking at determinants of health, the textbook goes in great detail on Blum's model of healthcare determinants. Blum's model has four different factors that it takes into consideration. One being environment, two being lifestyle, three being hereditary factors, and four being medical care. Textbook also uh, talks about contemporary, uh, more modern models of healthcare determinants. Also we'll talk about measures of 
um, measures that are related to health. So there's different ways that we measure health. There's physical measures and different formulas and equations that we use. Um, the first is going to be morbidity. The second is mortality. And then there are also demographic changes, which we will measure and put into ratios against morbidity and mortality. And those demographics are going to be births and migrations. There's some really good tables looking at life expectancy at birth and how those have evolved and some really good examples of how to do the math. This will be something that you will have to do, so make sure uh, you have those handy and available for your reference in future assignments. And so continuing our conversation on measures related to health, we also have measures of mental health. Um, I would argue that those are lacking and need continuous improvement, but we do have some there. There are also measures of social health, and so that includes uh, Breslow's social health dimensions and also uh, social contacts and social resources. And then there are various measures of spiritual health as well to take into consideration when we're looking at our health holistically. There are also different measures that we use for health services utilization. So we have crude measures of utilization, we have specific measures of utilization, and then we have measures of institution-specific utilization. We also have measures of global health, where we can compare how are we doing to the rest of the world, are we leading or are we lagging? So these can be direct indicators of global health or indirect indicators of global health. As we talked about earlier, there's also anthrocultural beliefs and values that can impact the healthcare system. Um, whether or not someone has a belief in a specific scientific advancement um, can have an impact on healthcare design and implementation and availability. Um, whether or not there's a championing of capitalism, the culture of capitalism, promoting an entrepreneurial spirit of self-determination and principles of free enterprise in a um, general distrust of the efficiency of large government and bureaucratic institutions. On the flip side, there are um, other anthrocultural beliefs and values that can also impact this system. One being the equitable distribution of healthcare through market justice versus social justice. And there are limitations to all these systems. There's no perfect, um, no perfect system and no perfect side on this equation all of them have their advantages and disadvantages, and so that's going to require collaboration, cooperation, and for you, the integration of your personal beliefs in order to uh, find a way to improve healthcare systems. And so make sure you take a look at that and gain an understanding. Make sure you have the ability to provide a comparison of market justice versus social justice and understand the advantages and disadvantages of both. All right, so moving on to the integration of individual and population health. There are several uh, key points on the Healthy People initiatives and the Healthy People 2020 plan, how those can be measured and how those can be achieved. Those are going to be in figures 2.5 and 2.6. Um, please take a look at those. And so, in summary for this chapter, the medical model of healthcare delivery um, currently today is emphasizing illness and wellness, and so regardless of what role you are taking in healthcare, um, in the front of your mind needs to be the goal and the objective of moving more towards a mindset of wellness, uh, preventative medicine, and of being proactive. This requires an understanding of what we talked about being health determinants, understanding initiatives like healthy people and their goals, and then having an understanding of how to contrast and understand the advantages and, and disadvantages of uh, different theories of market justice versus um, social justice. So as you can see, we've moved out here and we're very slowly moving in um, on our conversation of healthcare and the system will continue to move in that direction. Um, and so I look forward to providing chapter three to you in the near future.